In a minute, I'm going to ask Dorian Sagan to come up and uh, read a letter from Jim Lovelock. I met Jim a good 10 years before I met Lynn. I was a beginning graduate student at the University of Virginia, and we had invited Jim to give a talk. And the graduate students had a little cottage out in the countryside, and Jim was nice enough to come out and have dinner with us. And it was uh, in the early days of the formation of the Gaia hypothesis, and you can imagine the scene, their guru sitting there with all the uh, uh, students sitting on the floor around him listening to Gaia. Of course, as a biogeochemist, I wasn't all that interested in Gaia. I w what I was really impressed was, was that Jim had invented electron capture detection. And so that's what I wanted to talk about with Jim. Um, that night, Jim gave two pieces of advice for budding students. Uh, I, I still remember both of them quite well. The first he said, he said, don't spend too much time reading the literature. He said, most of the literature 10 years from now isn't going to be pertinent anyways. You should spend most of your time writing the literature, not reading it. Second thing he said to us was that, don't live near an airport. It's too easy for people to come visit you. <laughs> it, it is unfortunate that Jim wasn't able to come and visit with us today, but I do want to invite Dorian Sagan up to read a letter from him. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. This is from um, December 11, 2011. Dear Dorian, Jenny, Zach, and Jeremy, here is my essay in Lynn's memory. I may have been too anxious to put the science of it right, and there is nowhere enough about those good times when we gathered together in the Newton house and played games on those early Apple computers. Or the time when Lynn and I went to a Gordon conference in New Hampshire and Jenny and an odd French companion came with us. Maybe, like many Brits, I am prejudiced, but I, seem, I sense that we, have been we would have been happier without the French intruder. <laughs> I shall never forget the shock horror of Lynn's face when I arrived in La Jolla just before our expedition to Baja. I said that I had flown to the USA on Concord to be sure to be there on, the, on time. Lynn must have thought I was expecting the NSF to fund my fare. As it happened, it was a special deal. San Diego sold a Concord ticket at Coach Fair to promote their new airport or airplane. Zach, I shall always remember you, your visit to Coombe Mill via Callington. You certainly saw darkest England then and were so gracious about it. With love and thanks to you all, Jim. I'm Lynn Margulis from her close friend and colleague, Jim Lovelock. Today, November 24, 2011, is Thanksgiving, and I'm still shaken by the news that Lynn died two days ago. The news came from her lab by that laconic and heartless medium, email. I came from an older generation and still expect deeply moving or important news to come by a personal letter, not as a message sandwiched between slices of spam. It will take a long time to digest the fact that Lynn is no longer with us. The idea that the Earth is a live planet that regulates its surface and, and, and atmosphere and the interests of the biosphere is intimately connected with us both. It arose in my mind at JPL in 1965 when I shared an office in the Space Science Building with Carl Sagan. At that time, it was no more than an unusual idea that I shared with a small group of space, atmospheric, and climate scientists and three years before my friend, the Nobel Prize winning novelist, Bill Golding, gave the concept the name Gaia an homage to that classical Greek goddess of the earth. Lynn lived nearby at the time and was developing her theory of endosymbiosis, which is closely linked to Gaia, but it was seven years before we met as colleagues in 1972. She had written inviting me to call at her lab when next I was in the U.S. and talk about oxygen in the atmosphere. So I traveled to Boston from New Hampshire by bus, met Lynn at the airport, and traveled with her on the MTA to her lab at Boston University. She was the first biologist I had met who became excited by the idea of Gaia, and certainly the first to take it seriously. 
After a lively afternoon talking with her and her students, I asked if she could recommend a nearby motel where I could stay and continue the discussion next day. Lynn said, no, why not come here with me and meet my family? We can continue the discussion there and you can travel back here with me tomorrow. It was not long before a full collaboration was in progress and it led to the publication of two papers on Gaia, one for the Swedish Gaia is a tough bitch. For that audience, it was just right. But battling scientists usually fight with sharpened pens dipped in acid ink or with words spoken through subtly distorting megaphones, not with atom bombs. Her style of fighting, one that would have met with the approval of her fellow American, General Patton, did not go uncriticized. Lynn and I often argued as good collaborators should, and we wrangled over the intricate finer points of self-regulation, but always remained good friends. Perhaps we were confident that we were right. In these times of Facebook and letting it all hang out, many might find it hard to understand how we could work closely together and yet not be romantically engaged. The nearest we came to intimacy was in 1972, when I had my first heart attack on the road just outside and then inside Lynn's home in the suburb of Newton, Boston. I might not have written this had not Lynn and her husband, Nikki, given the help and support I needed. It is interesting to me that our battles with other scientists were limited to those in the earth and science departments of universities. Physicists and chemists were properly neutral, and climate scientists and meteorologists often welcomed Gaia. We collaborated with several scientists at the Cathedral of Science, the National Center for Atmospheric Research at Boulder, Colorado from 1962 until the 1990s. They included James Lodge, Will Kellogg, Steve Schneider, Lee Klinger, and Robert Dickinson. During the 1980s, there was almost a censorship by peer reviewers of any paper about Gaia unless it was critical of it. Apart from the distinguished geologist Robert Garrels, geologists were, like Dick Holland, quietly dismissive of Gaia and remained so until the 1990s. But an increasing number of Earth scientists came out of the sediments and began to realize that the Earth did indeed regulate its climate and chemistry. Disliking the name Gaia with its New Age associations, they called their neo-geology Earth System Science. Evolutionary biologists, especially neo-Darwinists, were among Lynn's favorite targets, and soon the arguments became so fierce that at one point the talented wordsmith and neo-Darwinist Richard Dawkins referred to Lynn as Attila the Hen. <laughs> and distinguished English neo-Darwinist John Maynard Smith referred to Gaia as an evil religion. When Ford Doolittle published his now famous critique of Gaia in Coevolution Quarterly, I could not stand outside and let this well-written and apparently logical demolition of Gaia become the last word. After some fairly ineffectual attempts to compose a verbal response, it occurred to me that so complex were the factors determining the mechanism of a planetary self-regulating system that a properly mathematical computer model was needed as an answer. It is important to know that even the simplest of self-regulating mechanisms resists rational explanation. To explain them requires a circular argument. Cause and effect thinking, so prevalent in science, fails to explain the facts of physiology, quantum physics, and many other real but inexplicable dynamic systems. I took time off and composed a computer program for the mathematical model, which is now known as Daisy World. I launched it at a meeting hosted by our good friend, Professor Peter Westbrook, first speaker tonight, in 1978 on the Dutch island of Walcheren. I knew that Daisy World was a definitive answer to the neo-Darwinist criticisms of Gaia and that it must be properly published in a peer-reviewed journal. 
This was done in collaboration with another friend, Andrew Watson, who among other qualities is a competent mathematician. So unpopular was Gaia then that despite my track record of numerous previous papers published in Nature, the journal would not take our Daisy World paper. It did not matter too much because the highly regarded Swedish journal, TELUS, took it. The emergence of Daisy World marked a watershed in the development of Gaia as a theory of the Earth. A great deal of the further papers on Gaia were about mathematical models that descended naturally from Daisy World. They involved extensive collaborations with my colleagues Tim Lenton and Stephen Harding. At the same time, it led to a drifting apart of the collaboration that Lynn and I had together. We remained close friends, but returned to our original scientific bases, biology for Lynn and transdisciplinary science for me. For me, and I hope, evolution, I hope eventually for most of science, Lynn's greatest contributions were in cellular biology. Her discovery of endosymbiosis, the process by which the complex eukaryotic cells of present day life evolved through the successful fusion of simpler and sing singular prokaryotes, bacteria. This is a key step in the evolution of life on Earth. Her great contribution to Gaia was to show that microorganisms now and from the beginning were the infrastructure of Gaia. Our tendency to ignore bacteria is an example of our false pride. Lynn was the first to tell me that we humans are mere cellular communities, huge ones comprising 10 billion living cells, but 90% of these are not human cells, but cells of other microorganisms the most, that most often are evolved to be friendly. The history of Gaia might be summarized by saying that I had, thanks to NASA, a top-down view of the Earth through telescopes and spectrometers and saw it as a system where the biosphere regulated its climate and chemistry. This was in 1965 when astronauts and all of you vicariously saw directly through your eyes that blue-white iconic sphere. In the early 1970s, Lynn gave us all the bottom-up view of Gaia through her microscope and showed that it was made of microorganisms and alive. Thank you. So we're going to take a, uh, a, a break here in a, in a second, but I, I wanted to um, also acknowledge um, everybody got a copy of a print of this uh, beautiful painting uh, that you see over here to the right of the stage. This was painted by uh, Shoshana uh, Dubiner, who is here. And this, uh, this painting and the plaque next to it of Lynn um, is going to be installed across the street in Moral Science Center. And it's really, it's at the confluence on the second floor there, the confluence of the biology and geosciences departments, a, a perfect place for this to go. And if anybody is interested in having that print signed by Shoshana, she's, uh, where is Shoshana? Yeah, there she is. So, so uh, just check in with, with her. One other thing before, uh, before we take a, a short break is um, Mark um, uh, Stetzler, is here from the Swiss community, uh, community Radio, and he would like to do interviews of anybody that would like to, um, to talk with him, and he's kind of interested in, in sort of three different areas. One is um, uh, Lynn's scientific contributions, um, mentoring of, of uh, women in science, and also uh, connections between uh, science and the arts. So, um, Mark, where are you? Just to point Mark out, if you would like to talk with, uh, with Mark and perhaps be interviewed, um, it would be a great opportunity either today or tomorrow or this evening.